DTLR Radio, your fashion, your lifestyle, your music, you plugged in with Fatim Got the Juice, live from 701 East Pratt Street. We are in downtown Baltimore at the Morning Hype documentary screening with some of our legends, yes, the guys that really pushed the wave of club music, not just Baltimore club music. We saying club music because it's gone so much further than just Baltimore. And right now, I'm sitting next to probably the first voice I think I heard on radio uh -huh. when I moved to Baltimore back in 94. Okay. Mr. Frank Ski is here. Now, this name sounds familiar to a lot of y'all because your, your, your parents listen to this man. Like He's he, Mr. Syndication, Mr. Mr. Big Radio, for, for sure, for sure. All right, now. You know, he does this at a very high level in a long time. So to be next to a legend, it's an honor. Thank How you, are man. you, Mr. Frank Ski? I'm good, man. I'm blessed to be here with you, that's for sure. Now, how's life been for you, Mr. Frank Ski? Yeah, no complaints, bro. That's great. No that is great. No complaints, man. Life is good. What's the key to the longevity for you? Uh, keep God first, keep family close, and do what you love. I got it. I got it. Now, Baltimore Clubbers, oh, Clubbers talk to me about it. When, when, when did you first hear it? What was your reaction? Well, that's an interesting concept because it wasn't around. So the first time I heard it was when we made it. <laughs> right. Right. So, I mean, you know, really it was kind of like a, it was kind of like a fusion of a lot of things happening at the same time. You know, we were all into uh, particular beats here, and there was a time in, in Baltimore in particular where there were two different sets of people in Baltimore. They were, they were club people, and then they were hoppers. They called them hoppers. And hoppers were like hip-hop kids, and club people were like club music kids, you know what I mean? And the club music culture at the time was real, you know, it was, it was, um, it was just a, a melting pot of gay and lesbian and everything. And then the Hoppers was like strictly hip hop. Um, but then we started a party back at Odell's on a Sunday night. Uh. And it was called the first Super Sunday party in Baltimore back then. And at that party, I remember we used to take the hip hop tracks and speed them up real fast so people can dance to them. And that was really the evolution. There were a few tracks that we would steal. They were coming over from Europe and other places and hip house was out at the time too as well. So, um, you know, we just fused our own thing. And, and Baltimore was more raw and just more, you know, dirty than what was coming out of Chicago and Detroit at the time. Now, let me ask you something. Speeding it up to today in age, right? What's your thought or how's your feeling of the kids sampling it these days and the way they're sampling it? I love it. I'm waiting for them to sample some more of my stuff. <laughs> now, listen. I'm ladies sending and my kids to college and everything with samples. What you talking about? Yeah. Now, listen. I don't know if you guys know right now you're listening. One of the, the big, I will say, one of the biggest that they would recognize our audience, Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion sampled his record on, on Wop. Yeah. And that's currently, what, six times platinum, seven times platinum? Eight. Eight times. Wow. Yeah. Now, the business on that, when you get that kind of call, how does that feel? I mean, really, it, it, it's kind of cool because when it happened, I was actually, it was right before the pandemic that I was uh, at a car wash. And, um, and Coach from QC pulled up to me at the car wash down in Atlanta. And he was like, Cardi is going to sample one of your songs. And I was like, bet, cool, just let me know. And then, like, over a year passed. And, you know, a lot of people had sampled it. Like, right around that time, Lil Wayne and Gucci had sampled it. Some other people had sampled it throughout the time. And, um, and then I got a request through my agent. And the request came with a um, uh, non-disclosure agreement. Wow. And so when the request came, they would not tell me who, who it was. But when I heard it, I was like, this is probably the Cardi record. Like, this is probably the Cardi and Megan record. And I remember that... Cardi announced that she was doing something with Megan and then they were going to have this big release on YouTube. And so it was right toward the end of the pandemic and they had this big party on a Thursday night and they had a big, it was live on YouTube. Everybody was streaming everything. And I remember I had to work the next day, but I'm sitting up in the bed with my wife and it's like 1150 and I'm like, come on, <laughs> when they going to play it? And it was like 1159 and they popping bottles on YouTube. And then Cardi said, all right, here it goes. This is our new song. Hope y'all enjoy it. And then, boom, right right in the beginning was like, there's some hoes in the house. And I was like, ah! <laughs> I was like, this is the one. But, you know, it, it, it's crazy. It's almost 30 years after the song came out. Timeless. Yeah. Timeless. Yeah. I'm waiting for them. 
I'm waiting for somebody big to sample Doo Doo Brown. That's coming. That that's definitely gonna come. Now I got another question. Um, how do you feel? Or, or what happens? What's the process of? Let's use this Drake record for um, lack of better words, one of the recent ones. What happens or what goes wrong when those samples don't get cleared or those artists don't know about it? So, so there's 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 two different things going on here. When you hear about those stories with somebody like Drake and even um, with a Beyonce and large artists like that, even on this latest Kanye West album, you know, what's really happening is they're sampling the songs, right? And they're putting the songs out. And there's an attempt to get it cleared. It just hasn't cleared yet. Now, at that particular time, because things are digital, right? Back in the day, the only thing you could do is if they said no, you would have to pull all your records off the record store shelf, right? It'd be a lot of money lost. Nowadays, the only thing ha that an artist has to do is pull it off of the stream, right? Now, if, if you got a song sampled by Kanye and he's gonna make a million dollars in a weekend, and then you say, well, you didn't clear my song. He says, okay, what's the clearance? And he said, well, I want this, I want this. Or, are you going to do this? And maybe Kanye West says, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. No worries. I'll take your sample off, and I'll put another sample on there. You'd be, you be stupid, <laughs> right? You'd be stupid, right? So when a, when a song comes through from a, from a big artist, the artists have more leverage now. You right. know what I'm saying? Now, there are some artists out there that, that will not – give you the clearance. Like I have a new album coming out with Danny Class called Climate Change and it's coming out on Earth Day, uh, April 22nd. And the lead song off of that album that we're putting out first is a version of Bill Withers' Lovely Day. Wow. Now, when we, when we went to clear it with Bill Withers, his family initially said no. They said no three times. And then finally they came back and they said, well, well if we clear it, we want all the publishing. 100 percent right which is which is crazy right but i would still make the master money with danny but really the publishing is what has the long value right so now that the song is getting ready to come out the promotion is starting to happen or whatever the family is loosening up more and they're like well you know okay cool let's talk we you know this is this is cool what you guys are doing whatever and it takes time sometimes you know um but at the end of the day listen if somebody came to me and said well we want to do doo doo brown and you know, how much do you want? And, and you know, if I say 50% and they say, yeah, that's found money for me, right? right. That's, that's nothing. So for Bill Withers' family, this is found money for them. You know what I mean? And, and you don't want to oversaturate your samples where everybody's sampling because then nobody wants to sample it no more. Yep. And I think that's, you know, they're hoping for a song like Lovely Day for somebody to redo it, right? Just like with Tracy Chapman's Fast Cars, right? The right person redid the song at the right time, and she, 30 years later, made a few million dollars, right? But if everybody had been doing the song a hundred times, he might not have, you know, he might not have wanted to redo it. So I, I can understand from the family perspective as well. But the real issue that's going on, let me just say this, and this is a real controversial thing. The problem that's happening now is, since they've taken music out of the schools, a lot of these producers don't know music. They're not they're not musically trained, right? Uh. So making a beat is making a beat is not hard. The computer can make you the beat. You can go online and buy loops and get fruity loops and all kinds of programs and make beats. Making a beat is not a song. A song is a composition. It has melodies, it has drops, it has breaks, it has all kinds, it has bridges, it has a lot of things. Making a great song requires a producer that knows music and is also a songwriter. The problem is these kids out here today, they're not that. So what they have to do in order to get their melodies, they sample them. And that's why you're seeing all the 90s music being sampled and redone by everybody. Because everybody. Because that's, that's, the, that's the only thing they know. I mean, at the end of the day, you listen to a Michael Jackson album that Quincy Jones did or a Stevie Wonder album, the amount of musical shit that's going on in that song is mind-blowing. You know what I mean? You got like, you got, you know, 20 musicians on one song playing different things where nowadays you got one kid in his room on a laptop that might not even be able to play a keyboard. You get what I'm saying? So. That's the difference. So, so that's why sampling. That's why you see all these companies buying these artists' publishing because they know 
in the next 10 years, especially 20 years from now, nobody is going to be able to, not only very few people are going to be able to make musical compositions. Oh, that makes so much sense. That's why. That makes so much sense. And everybody's selling. Everybody's selling. I mean, at the end of the day, at my age now, I got to think to myself, how much more money I can make, right? And then, then the other side of it is, can my family manage my catalog when I die? Fortunately for me, two of my sons are in the business. Oh, that's great. My son Franklin is Jeezy's executive assistant. Harrison oh. is a studio rat and a musician, and he's up in Tricky Studio working. I'm um, in Tricky Studio. You know, they just finished working on some Rihanna shit and whatever. But the thing is, so they're in the business. So they understand the value of what their dad has created. So would I sell? Probably not, because they still have the leverage of managing my catalog before it goes into public domain. So right now, the, the answer is no. But you know what? Let me not say no. Because if somebody <laughs> came with the right bag. Like, listen, we're going to break this up with y'all. <laughs> y'all look good. Make sure your kids straight. Man, we're all straight. On. We're come good. On. That's it. We're good. Now, what is your greatest club music memory? Oh, uh, man, my greatest club music memory, um, I got so many. What people don't realize is that I think my, my, um, donation that I've made to the culture is one. not just the music. It was the access. So creating Super Sundays and having the leverage because I was on the radio and I'm in all these black organizations in the city and I'm involved with the mayor, I was able to do stuff that nobody was able to do. I was able to get off-duty police officers to keep the party safe when no other club was allowed to have them. Man. So when having the access, understand, you know, I did Super Sundays at Hammerjacks. That was my thing. I did, I was the first person to open the Paradox on Sunday for Super Sundays. I did the Paradox. I did Godfrey's. I did, you know, I did the sports bar. You know, I did Shake and Bake. I did all of these parties. And at the end of the day, it's the access to the music that was being created. And I was on the radio. So I had my own show and I got to play what the hell I wanted to play every night, you know, especially on Friday night. So I was able to break a lot of music and get this music out and create this culture. Um, but I gave access, you know, and that's what that's the gift that God gave me that I gave back to the culture is to open up the access. And that was it. How hard was it for you to leave the city of Baltimore? Terribly hard. I, I remember when you left. And, Terribly hard. And I, and I was I was so young, yeah. so I didn't know the impact, and I wasn't originally from here, right? Yeah. But it was I, hard. It was hard. It was it was a sad day, and, and it still is. That's why I love coming home, you know. And and you know I had to fly in for this event tonight because, you know, I know the hard work that went into this project. You know what I mean? I know the hard work that you guys are doing, you know, at at, at the radio. I you know, and this this show right here, like. Like, this is not easy, bro, so I'm here for y'all. Listen, we appreciate you. We thank you for your huge contribution to this culture. And you know, we're still fans here. Absolutely. So we thank, thank you for you, being man. here. Enjoy the night and enjoy thank your you. trip home. No doubt. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the legendary Frank Ski. Make sure you watch that More Than Hype documentary. It will be out very soon. He's going to hit the festivals pretty soon. All right, let's go.